So in, in 2009, um, I started acting erratically um, and out of character, and it started very subtly, just with some paranoid thoughts, and nothing that I thought I needed to go to see a doctor about. Um, ooh. Uh, and, and, but then um, things started progressing and getting worse and worse, and I, I had a seizure, and one of many, and um, I ended up in the hospital for a month when, where I was ultimately diagnosed with what's called anti-NMDA receptor autoimmune encephalitis. So that's kind of the backstory, the quick backstory. Uh, I'm going to read um, two chapters from my book, and there are different phases in the illness. Um, the first I'm going to read um, is an example of my psychosis during the height of the disease. And that was when I had been in the hospital for about five days at that point, was the height of that psychosis period. And the second piece I'm going to talk to read about is actually um, the step towards getting an ultimate diagnosis, um, the first step that led me to finally getting the diagnosis that I got. So I'm going to start here. Okay. Later that same day, a fifth doctor joined the team. My case had piqued the interest, interest of Dr. Ian Arslan, a psychopharmacologist who tops six feet and who looked more like an aging hippie than a doctor. Because of his fondness for beat generation writers and his cerebral way of communicating abstract medical jargon, a colleague described him as a walking beatnik dictionary. He had already heard about my escape attempts and paranoid delusions, so he approached my mother first, asking her to walk him through the past few weeks of my bizarre behavior. Then he interviewed my father. After a short interview with me, which yielded a vivid portrait of my dysfunction, he gathered statements from the nursing staff and even called up Dr. Bailey, who had been a neurologist that I had seen prior to my hospital stay, who told me that I had, had was suffering from alcohol withdrawal. Uh, that, uh, who, according to Dr. Arslan's notes, told him that I drank excessively up, up to two bottles of wine per night when I had told him that I had two glasses of wine per night. Dr. Bailey's estimate of my vices seemed to have substantially increased. Having summarized all of this, Dr. Arslan jotted down the two diagnoses he wanted to rule out, postictal psychosis and schizoaffective disorder. Knowing it would upset them, he did not share the second diagnosis with my parents. The term schizoaffective disorder was introduced in 1933 in a much quoted paper, The Schizoaffective Psychosis. Quote, like a bolt from the blue, full-blown delusions suddenly shatter the poise of a fully rational, rational mind and flare up without any premonitory signs. A more updated description defines it as a diagnosis when mood symptoms, which are characteristic of bipolar disorder, overlap with psychosis, which is symptomatic of thought disorders like schizophrenia. So I have um, an EEG video. During my, since I was on the epilepsy floor there, there were actually videos taken of me. And I have an EEG video, and I'm, I'm going to describe that video here of myself. Um, this is EEG video, March 24th, 11.06 PM, and it's 11 minutes long. Patient push button in room 1279. Patient push button in room 1279, the pre-recorded voice says. My hospital gown peeks through, through from the covers that are pulled up to my neck, and I hold a cell phone to my ear, talking animatedly into its mouthpiece. It is unclear if anyone else is on the other line. I pick up the hospital-provided TV remote and speak into it. There is certainly no one at the other end of that conversation. I point to the camera accusingly, gesticulating wildly, and put my hands to my head in frustration. Oh my God, I cry and hit the nurse's call button. Can I help you, a nurse says over the intercom. No, no, it's okay. Ma'am, lady, miss, I'm coming, another nurse chimes in. I'm mumbling to myself now. I don't know what's happening. I'm going to turn my phone off. I, to I toss my cell phone to the foot of the bed. A nurse arrives with some pills, and I swallow them without hesitation. I can't have it on me. I'm on the news, I shout. The nurse answers, but too softly for the video to pick up. I begin to shout and kick my legs, and I grab for the nurse's call button. Please, 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 I'm freaking out. I'm freaking out. Patient push button in room 1279. Please put the TV back on, I shout. Please put the TV back on. Ignoring my outburst, the nurse positions the guardrails to make sure they're firmly in place. Don't you see? I'm on the news. I'm on the news, I howl. I pick up the TV remote and speak into it again, and then place my head in my hands and rock back and forth. 
please, 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 oh my God, oh my God, please get me a doctor, please get me a doctor. The nurse leaves, there is a flushing of toilets. I stare straight up at the ceiling as if I am praying. That's the end of the video. So I remember a little of this hallucination. And so this is my memory of that was the objective video. This is what I remember. We'll be investigating what's happening with news reporter Susanna Cahalan, currently at New York University. A coiffed female anchor announces, I am top of the hour news. I'm on the news, I call out. Her father was recently arrested for the murder of his wife. The anchor says, as the camera pans, my father walking handcuffed through a sea of paparazzi. I've been so stupid, I shouldn't have answered calls from coworkers. They are secretly writing down what I'm saying. They know I cried in the newsroom. They'll put that into my story. New York Post reporter unravels after father kills wife. I'm on the news. I grab the emergency call nurse's call button. They have to know about the plot. They have to know not to let anyone in. They're all going to try to interview me, I scream into my cell phone. Beads of sweat form on my brow. I wipe them away. I hear the cackling of the patient to my left, a South American woman who spent all day chatting with her visitors in Spanish, or was it Portuguese? Now she's laughing at me. Maybe she was laughing at me the whole time. I hear her faint fingernails tap, tap on her cell phone keys. She's speaking in Spanish, or whatever language it is now. It is, but now I can understand it. There's a girl from the New York Post in the bed next to me. I'm going to record her with my cell phone, and I'll give you the information, and you can give it to the Post. Tell them it's an exclusive from someone in the hospital. This girl is crazy, trust me. Trust me, this is good stuff. We can make a lot of money with this scoop. Tell them everything, just make sure we get some money out of it. Psst, what the hell was that? Psst, I hear it again. I turn my, turn my head to the left. The South American woman has stopped her maniacal texting and has moved the curtain with her hand so that I can see her face. The nurses here are bad news, she says softly. What, I ask? Not sure if I heard her correctly or if she spoke at all. Shh, they can hear you, she hisses. The nurses here aren't right. I don't trust any of them. Yes, yes, strange Spanish lady, that is true. But why is this undercover agent telling me this, I think? She moves the curtain back in place, leaving me alone. I need to leave, now. Once again, I grab the wires on my head, handful by handful, pulling them out with chunks of hair, and throw them on the floor. Instantly, I'm at the door. I'm through it. My heart pounds. I can feel it leaping into my lungs. The security guard doesn't notice me. I, sp I sprint to the red exit sign. A nurse runs up beside me. Think, 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 Susanna. I dodge into the hallway and run, racing, 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 directly into another nurse's arms. Let me go home. Let me leave. She takes me by the shoulder. I kick her, screaming. I bite at the air. Let me go. The cold floor. A purple lady grabs hold of my feet as the other nurses hold my arms down. Please, please, I try to say through clenched teeth, please let me go. Darkness. At the interval history that they took that day reads, patient became very agitated last evening. She ripped off her electrodes and ran past the one-to-one -one up and down the hallways. This occurred despite receiving Seroquel. She was then given Ativan for ad agitation and placed temporarily in a chest posy for safety by an on-call resident. She also received 25 milligrams of Lepressor yesterday early evening for elevated blood pressure and tachycardia. Vitals were ordered. Okay, and then this is about three weeks later. In my ho now in my hospital room, Dr. Suhel Najjar crouched down beside me and said, I will do my best to help you. I will not hurt you. I didn't say anything, looking emotionless. Okay, let's begin. What is your name? A considerable pause. Susanna, what is the year? Pause, 2009, he wrote down monosyllabic. What is the month? Pause, April, April, I struggled here. He wrote down indifferent, meaning apathetic. What is the date? I looked forward, showing no emotion, saying nothing, not blinking. He wrote down paucity of eye blinking. I didn't have an answer for him on this one. Who is the president? Pause. I raised my hand rigidly in front of me. He wrote, stiff-bodied on his chart. What? No emotions, nothing. Who is the president? He noted, lack of attention span. Oh, Obama. He wrote, low tone, monotonous, with a substantial lisp. I was not able to control the movements of my tongue. He removed a few tools from his white lab coat. 
Using a reflex hanger, hammer, he tapped on my kneecaps, which, which did not jerk forward the way they should. He shined a light into my eyes, noting that my pupils were not properly constricting. Okay, now touch your nose with this hand, he said, touching my right arm. Stiffly and robotically, I raised my arm and in several slow moving motions, reached my hand to my face, narrowly missing my nose. Hellishly catatonic, he thought. Okay, he said, testing my ability to do a two-step command. Touch your left ear with your left hand. He grazed my left hand arm to indicate right from left, doubting I could figure it out on my own. I didn't move or react. Instead, I just sighed. He told me to forget about this step and moved on to another. I'd like you to get out of bed and walk for me. I dangled my feet over the edge and slid haltingly onto the floor. He took my arm and helped me stand. Will you walk a straight line one foot after the other, he asked. Taking a minute to think it through, I began walking in short spurts, but with delays between steps. I angled toward my left side. Najar noticed I was showing signs of ataxia, a lack of coordinated movement. I walked and talked like many of his late stage Alzheimer's patients. Uh, and then he had an idea, the clock test. Although developed in the mid-1950s, the clock test had been entered into the American the DSM in 1987 and is used to diagnose problem areas of the brain in Alzheimer's stroke and dementia patients. Dr. Najjar handed me a blank sheet of paper that he ripped out of his notebook and said, would you draw a clock for me and fill in the numbers, one through 12? I looked up at him with confusion. As you remember it, Susanna, it does not have to be perfect. I hesitated. He could see me straining to remember what a clock face looked like. I hunched over the paper and began to write. Methodically, I wrote the numbers. Often I would get stuck on a number and draw it several times. More perseverative dysgraphia. After a moment, Dr. Jar looked down at the page and nearly applauded. I had squished all the numbers, one through 12, onto the right-hand side of the circle. It was a perfect specimen, with the 12 o'clock landing almost exactly where the 6 o'clock should have been. Dr. Najjar, beaming, grabbed the paper, showed it to my parents, and explained what this meant. They gasped with a combination of terror and hope. This was finally the clue that everyone was searching for. It didn't involve fancy machinery or invasive tests. It required only paper and pen. It had given Dr. Najjar concrete evidence that the right hemisphere of my brain was inflamed. Her brain is on fire, he told my parents. They nodded, eyes wide. Her brain is under attack by her own body. <laughs>